tonight we are diving a little bit deeper in the missions component of the church and its mission. As you guys know, we've spent a lot of time on the church. Now we're talking about more on the mission side of things. But yet, at the same time, since it's the mission of the church, we're still talking about the church throughout really all of this. Um, Today's title is Missions Exists Because Worship Doesn't. Um, I've talked about this title in the past. Do you guys remember where this is from? I know you do. Yeah, all right, wonderful. So I have the book here, um, Let the Nations Be Glad by John Piper. It's one of my favorite books on missions, if not my favorites, um, just talking about missions. Um, I might put some like missionary biographies alongside it, um, but this is one of the better ones. Um, it's the one that you could get if you desire to do the supplemental reading in addition to the missions class that we have on Sunday mornings. Um, but that's really driving the topic for tonight, at least. Uh, so you could see the goal for tonight uh, on your note sheet is to consider the purpose of the church by considering the purpose of its mission. Um, so if we say the mission of the church, the purpose of the church is to complete the Great Commission and the purpose or the purpose of the mission is to glorify God, then ultimately we can say the purpose of the church, right, is to glorify God. It ties back to that. Um, so that's where we're going for tonight. That's, that's the direction we're, we're going. So let's look at the review um, section from past weeks. Uh, we have our ecclesiology and missiology. Missiology flow out of the doctrine of God and leads to doxology. So that has been really the structure, theological structure we've been using to look through um, all the things we've been talking about this semester. Uh, for some of the fill in the blanks here, you can see it says, in Matthew 16, we see Jesus give the keys of the kingdom of heaven to the apostles, um, specifically Peter, but the apostles in general. And in Matthew 18, we see the keys of the kingdom given to the church. All right, so that's the fill in the blank there. Uh, the church is to be congregationally ruled, Elder, led, deacon, served. Wonderful. Yeah, so we spent time talking about that. Um, and now this next section of fill in the blank is from last week. Um, so let's see if, we, if you guys could uh, do this one. The church is the blank and blank of missions. Means and end of missions. Because the church is the body of Christ helping the bride of Christ get ready for the return of Christ. Um, so you see the church is the, the means and the end of missions because the church is the body of Christ helping the bride of Christ. So it's the means, right? The church is the one helping themselves really being built up, getting ready for the return of Christ, uh, which is the end, um, so that we can be uh, holy, without blemish, spotless, um, as uh, Ephesians 1 talks about for when Christ returns. All right, so that's, where, that's some of the things we talked about last week. Um, and I have a question here, uh, just before we really jump into our discussion for tonight. Uh, the question is, how are healthy local churches a physical sign are of our eternal union with Christ in heaven? How are healthy local churches a physical sign of our eternal union with Christ in heaven? I am asking this question. I want you guys to look back at we, what we just said right before this question. I'm asking this question because we're saying the church is the means and the end of missions. And so if we're saying it's the end of missions, like to, is to establish healthy churches, um, and the end here is 
to, for us to get ready for the return of Christ, so then that's what's really prompting this question if you're following along. How are healthy local churches, which is the end, a physical sign of the end, which is the return of Christ or our eternal union with Christ in heaven? If you didn't follow that, that's fine. Let's just focus on the question. To be what? That's right. Yeah, so... Yeah. That's right. That's why we would require believer's baptism uh, before becoming a member of a church because really at believer's baptism, that's not what saves you, right? But generally, before you get baptized, uh, the pastor or whoever's working with you tests to see if you have a genuine conversion experience, if your testimony holds up to what our true confession is, that Jesus is the Son of God, right? So in order to answer this question, this is what I wrote, and so you guys could at least understand where I'm going with this question. So how are healthy local churches the physical sign of our eternal union with Christ in heaven? Uh, my answer, at least, is they give us a picture of what heaven will be like when we gather to worship the Lord. So every single time you step into a Sunday morning service, it ought to be a a picture of what heaven will look like when we gather to worship the Lord. It's a glimpse of heaven here on earth. As Matthew 16, or not 16, Matthew 6.10, so this is the Lord's Prayer. Um, in Matthew 6.10, prayed, uh, pray for the kingdom of God to come on earth as it is in heaven. And when we see that coming here on earth, is through the establishment of the church here on earth. Um, so it's a, it's a physical picture for us to see the spiritual reality of what will be true when Christ returns. All right. Are there any comments about any of the review stuff? No? All right. So, question for us to look at. We're going to be spending a lot of time in Ephesians. So you, if you have your Bibles, you can keep your Bibles open to Ephesians. Um, as we have been spending a lot of time in Ephesians the past several weeks. Ephesians is just a wonderful book. Um, you can see the question, though. Why does the church exist? Why does the church exist? And I, you can see I have a passage here, Ephesians 3. And then the question right below that is, why does the church exist according to this passage? Um, so I want us to read it together. Um, underline, circle, whatever stands out to you in this particular passage, and then we will discuss this passage with the next several questions underneath it. All right? Um, does anyone want to read this for us? I'll read it. Thank you. All right, Ephesians 3, 8 through 11. To me, Paul, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wonderful. So the first question I have for us is, why does the church exist according to this passage. Make known the manifold, manifold wisdom. All right, so make, full the, make known the manifold wisdom. Lonnie was saying uh, to preach to the Gentiles. Did you say the unsearchable riches of Christ? Is that? The Gentiles and the, the bringing the light. For yeah, okay, that's right. And more specifically, when it talks about through the church, it mentions the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rules and authorities in the heavenly places. Um, so, I mean, all this is connected, right? Uh, Paul here is talking to the church in Ephesus. Um, the eternal will of God, as it presents it, begins it in chapter 1. This is the will of the Lord for you to be holy and blameless. And he starts talking about what this looks like to um, pursue this, to be in union with Christ, really, as a church body. So, 
What I have for an answer here is why does the church exist according to this passage? Well, if we're just going to follow, the, write what's exactly in the verse, following what is being done through the church, it's to display the manifold wisdom of God to all. And that includes then to preach the gospel, right? That includes um, bringing the light for everyone to see. But plainly speaking, as this passage is presenting it, it says, through the church, the manifold, of, manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So it's to display the wisdom of God for all to see. Right? I mean, that's what um, we are intended to be, uh, a, a signpost right, of the kingdom of heaven or a signpost of the wisdom of God here on earth. Yes? So you said to everybody, but when it says to the rulers and authorities in other places, well, who is that? Yeah, that's a good question. Here, actually, in the, this context right here, I think this is referring to um, angelic and demonic beings. Um, so just uh, in the hel- those who are in the heavenly realm. So that actually makes it a little bit even more special where we're not just making it known, the wisdom of God known to other physical beings like us here on earth, but even to the heavenly realm. Um, so, and this is, I would tie this passage actually back to the last chapter in Ephesians um, where it talks about putting on the armor of God, right? Because of the spiritual forces that you're fighting against. Um, the wisdom of God is made known to those spiritual forces by you being a local church, by you acting as a church. But then also we have to put on the uh, full armor of God as we um, combat them. But that's going down a different tangent line, uh, line of thought that we don't necessarily need to go down, but we can if you guys desire. But that's my short answer. But I, I say to all because we also know it's, as what Lonnie said, preaching it to the Gentiles, um, we know that it's through the church God desires to make his wisdom known to the rest of creation as well. So, all right, next question. So, if it is to display the manifold wisdom of God to all, the next question is, what is the manifold wisdom of God that the local church is meant to show or meant to display? We've already kind of started to say it with Lonnie. What was that? Way of salvation. The way of salvation. Yes. If we're going to pull out the terms used in this particular passage, what would we say? Eternal purpose accomplished in Christ Jesus. Yeah. So, um, the eternal purpose, we could say, uh, to bring to light for everyone what is the plan. So, uh, what is the manifold wisdom of God that the church might show? It's the plan of the mystery that was hidden uh, for ages in God. Um, This is where we see this plan is to show, to reveal the unsearchable riches of Christ. So it's through the church we see the wisdom of God. That sounds like we're saying the church is the means to show God to us, right? Kind of what we're saying that uh, the church is the means and end of missions. Um, and so what is this plan? It's salvation. It's where we see the unsearchable riches of Christ. But ultimately, all this culminates in the kingdom of God here on earth. All this culminates in the church. So we see the church being the means to display the wisdom of God so that we might see or those in the heavenly places might see this great plan that was hidden for ages in God that even the Gentiles will be made one with the Jews in this new person of Christ, uh, which is the establishment of the church. So if you want, look with me um, in Ephesians 1, 22 through 23. So I'm going to start jumping over through several passages here in Ephesians. So what I'm proposing is that this plan that was hidden for the ages um, 
is really the plan of the church, that there will be one body uh, where we're all united together. So Ephesians 1, 22 through 23 says, uh, Ephesians 1, 22 through 23, And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, referring to Christ, giving him to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Ephesians 2, 13 through 18, it says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law and commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. Again, he's talking about the plan here that was hidden in him for all of eternity. Uh, So making peace, verse 16, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, therefore killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. Um, And then, 18, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. And then jump over to chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. It says, For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming you have heard um, of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. So he's talking about the same mystery, the plan. As I have written briefly, when you read this, you can perceive my insights into the mystery of Christ, which was made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it, or that was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the spirits. This mystery is, if you want to know what it is, plainly, it's here in verse 6, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body. So it's referring to the church here. Um, And partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And then jumping over to Ephesians 3 still, verses 20 and 21, it says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Finally, jumping over to chapter 5 of Ephesians, starting in verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her from the washing of, the wa- of water and, or with the word, so that he might present the church to himself with spl- in splendor, without spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. You could uh, connect that section to chapter 1, where it says this is the eternal plan of God, that we might be holy and without blemish. Um, and then verse 28. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall love or leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife um, and the two shall become one. This mystery, so referring still to this mystery that's all throughout this book, is profound and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. It's referring to Christ and the church. This is the mystery that was hidden from eternity past, that the Gentiles will be engrafted in, that they would be um, part of this one new body that's ultimately making up the body of Christ here on earth where we see the kingdom of God displayed for the world to see. This was God's plan from the very beginning. So it's through the church, the wisdom of God is seen. um, And what is this wisdom? This wisdom is this plan that was revealed so the church is the means and the end of missions. Uh, the church is the, me- 
is the means because it's through the church this wisdom is revealed and it's the end because it's the plan that was always going to happen from the beginning of time. And so I think we see that really well just through this brief survey of Ephesians here. Um, there was a lot there. Does anyone have any questions or comments or pushbacks anywhere? All right. So I want us to see, I mean, really the beauty of the church, not just saying how great we are, but how great God's plan is from eternity past uh, to make his glory known. So let's look at this next question. This first part of this question should be easy now for us. Um, how long was this hidden mystery displayed through the church planned for? Forever, for eternity past. Um, in eternity past. Um, so we see in verse 11 of chapter 3, this was according to the, to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's the eternal purpose. If you look at chapter 1, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him. Chose us, this is referring to the Gentiles, um, the Jews, anyone who is going to be making up the church, uh, before the foundations of the world. There again, we see it. It's the eternal purpose of God. Um, so, how long was this hidden plan, or hidden mystery planned for? In eternity past. Um, it was always his plan. It is God's eternal purpose, which was realized in Christ, which is realized in Christ. Um, the passage I just read in Ephesians 1, chapters, or verses 3 through 6, uh, shows that this mystery was hidden for all of, uh, since the beginning of time until it was fully realized in Christ. Uh, let's look at this next question here. Um, so what is the intended end result in revealing this mystery, which is God's eternal purpose? What is the intended result in revealing this mystery? So God reveals this mystery to us through the church that there will be his church. So it's the means and the end. But what is the intended purpose in doing all of this? Well, Worship. So look at verse, um, verse 11. Um, actually, verse 13. So go back to chapter 3. Um, I'm going to start reading in verse 11. It says, This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him, uh, so I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is uh, your glory. So we, this is, we receive glory from this. That's not actually the passage I was going to go to. Um, where is it? Um, verse 6. This is it. Verse 6 of chapter 1. So I'm going to read verses 3 through 6 again, where it's talking about this was... In eternity past, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in himself before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. He's referring to the church and how the church is going to be holy and blameless. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Again, it's his will in eternity past. Verse 6 to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. So all of this to, um, comes to the end that it's for or it's to the praise of his glorious grace where God ultimately gets the glory for what he has done in revealing the church through the church. And it's glorious to Christ because again, who is the church? The church is 
the body of Christ, where Christ is revealed here in this world. Um, so, what is the intended end result in revealing this mystery? God's eternal purpose. It's to reveal why God is glorious. Uh, it's to reveal his, his praise, his glory. Um, and I hope you'll be able to see a little bit more of that um, as we continue with this lesson. So, that's a huge survey through e- Ephesians. Um, are there any comments or questions about any of that? Here. Yes, Katie. Um, I just noticed that in that opening section of chapter 3, three times he refers to it being God's grace given to him to preach. Mm. And so, you know, I don't know here in the context, you know, was it challenging preaching to the Gentiles, but whatever it is, he's, it's, it's, it's a grace to preach. And I think that's like probably a good Yeah. You know, for anyone is. who has the Great Commission, all yeah. Christians are basically called to this. So it's a, it's a, a grace and a privilege to be able to do so. Yeah. Yeah. And th- when we receive the grace of, of God, we are experiencing really his unsearchable riches of Christ that uh, is mentioned in, cha- in verse 8 in chapter 3 here. Um, and all that is displayed through the church, for the church. And since it's the glory of God being displayed through the church, for the church, God is the one who gets the glory in the end. It's for his glorious purpose to exalt himself in that. Um, Other comments or questions about any of this? What time is it? 7.02. All right. So we just talked a lot, and we haven't even gotten to the quote yet where um, that's intended for this lesson. Um, So like we had mentioned at the beginning, uh, the quote that we started with, or that's really making up the title of this lesson, is from the book, Let the Nations Be Glad, by uh, John Piper. And I um, just put the quote in the larger um, paragraph that actually starts this book. So it's the very first paragraph of the book. And you could see um, it says, if you follow along with me on your note sheet, missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. When you first hear that, you might hesitate and won't say, well, isn't it? Um, because we say missions is the mission of the church, but really missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Uh, this is why we would say missions exists because worship doesn't. All around the world, there's many places around the world where worship doesn't exist, where God is not known by people. And so, Uh, That's why we need to do missions so they can know God and worship him. Continuing with this quote, Worship is ultimate, not missions, because God is ultimate, not man. When this age is over and the countless millions of the redeemed fall on their faces before the throne of God, missions will be no more. It is a temporary necessity. But worship abides forever. So um, it's getting us ready uh, to behold the glory of God um, for eternity. That's what missions is for. It's getting us ready to behold the glory of God in eternity. Um, To get us ready to be holy and blameless Again, this is why we would say missions is not just evangelism. Missions also includes discipleship. Um, It's baptizing and teaching all that I have commanded you. Uh, It's not just getting people to the starting line and leaving them there, right? The starting line is just people come to know the Lord, but then there's a whole race to run uh, to become holy and blameless. Our goal in life is to become holy and blameless so that we can get ready for the return of Christ, um, to behold him by sight and not just by faith. All right. Um, What I did here in the next 
section of your note sheet. Um, I just took the first part of this book. Um, I encourage you, like I said earlier, to read it. But I just took the first part of three parts of the book um, and did a very quick survey that we'll look through. Uh, so Tyler, this might be um, just review, and you might have better insight on some of this stuff because you've read it more freshly than I have, more recently, I should say, than I have. Um, but you could see <coughs> the first part really talks about the supremacy of God in missions through worship, prayer, and suffering. So we're going to look at those three things. And he breaks it up here, John Piper does, uh, by uh, purpose, power, and price. So what is the purpose of missions? We've already defined that, or at least shown that. Hopefully we've already seen that it's worship. Um, it's worship. And when we say it's worship, we're not saying it's something different than the church, because it's in the church we see God being worshipped. So we're not saying two different things there. Um, so uh, I want us to look at Revelation. If you have your Bibles, uh, this is now where we're leaving Ephesians, uh, obviously. Revelation, and we've already looked at this passage a couple weeks ago or maybe last week. Uh, chapter 19, to make the point even more so that when I say the purpose of missions is worship, we're not saying something different, that the end of missions is um, the church. So Revelation 19, starting in verse 6, I'm going to read verse 6 through 8. This is finally, again, when Christ returns for his bride, when we have been made holy and blameless, as Ephesians talked about, what is going to happen, the marriage supper of the Lamb. When I heard, so obviously this is John speaking, uh, when I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like a roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty pearls and thunder crying out, or peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns, let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Referring to the church. It, is, it was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. Uh, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. So what do we see here? We see, um, finally, when the church is made pure and holy, it's where God is being exalted and worshipped. Right? Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory. And this is what's going to then go on for all of eternity. Right? So when we see the, the bride get, um, get fully ready, where she is holy and blameless, this is where Christ gets the glory. Um <clears throat> You can actually, this is interesting. So look at the first sentence of Piper's quote here, which says, missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Uh, you could actually switch the first sentence around and make it true. Uh, and what I mean by that, you could say, you could switch around missions and church and make it a true statement, uh, which would be, church is the ultimate goal. The church is the ultimate goal of missions um, because, again, it's the church, the holy and uh, blameless um, bride of Christ at the end of time is where we see Christ being worshipped. So the church is the ultimate goal of missions. It's the means and the end because it's through the church we see the, the worship of God um, on display uh, because it's in and through the church that, God, that Christ is glorified. Um, so I, I just thought it was interesting how you could switch that there on the first sentence of Piper's quote and make it a true sentence. Um, are there any questions so far on any of this? Wonderful. So what is the power of missions? 
the answer is already given in your note sheet. But do you guys agree with that? Or do you not agree with that? Um, how can we talk about it in a faithful way? What is the power of missions? We see the purpose is worship. The power of it is... Prayer and the Holy Spirit are linked together. Um, when you receive the Holy Spirit, that's what gives you access to God, which is then prayer. So you can never talk about prayer absent from the Holy Spirit. But I was just thinking about using the Holy Spirit absent prayer right there. Does that make sense? Say that one more time. What is the power of missions? Exactly. What do you mean by power? That was going to be my question. What do you mean by the power of missions? This is Piper's terminology, not mine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's what makes it effective? What makes it able to be done? Um, is really what it's asking here. Uh, how is missions effective? Where does it get its power from in order for it to be accomplished? The purpose of it is worship, but how do we get there? Um, here, prayer and the Holy Spirit, it's right, Tyler, to point that out, that really we need to be talking about the Holy Spirit. Um, but prayer and the Holy Spirit are linked together in a way that Scripture, the way Scripture talks about it, where you can't have prayer without the Holy Spirit. Uh, you can't have the Holy Spirit without prayer, right? So I, I like the way you're thinking, which is, that's like, for mission, so it's the Holy Spirit that you know, pushes you towards it to do it, yeah. that empowers you to do it while you're doing it, that fills your mouth with the words that say what you need to say in order to spread the, the word. And so it's really, I would say, so you said that the power behind missions is the Holy Spirit, well, not just prayer. What is prayer? Let's talk about that. What is prayer? Is prayer simply just giving a, a verbal response to God, or is, some, is prayer more? What is it? Yeah, it's communicating with God. Okay. What was that? It can be a two-way conversation. Okay. That's right. So the way God speaks to us is through his word. right? The way we, sp we speak to God, communicate to God, is in prayer. Um, so prayer is how we connect with God. right? It's us communicating to God, having active relationship with God. You could pray in your mind. You could pray verbally out loud. It's any... Worshipful action, like you intend, like you intentionally responding to God in some way, um, is what prayer is. And how is that done in the Spirit? And so that's the point. So yes, I think it's fair to maybe say, maybe we should use the term Holy Spirit here. But this is only done in the Spirit. Mm -hmm. You can't have any communication back to God. Um, any type of response to God without the Spirit. The Spirit is where we ha come uh, to God. So, so you're saying that any action where you are <coughs> that's done with a worshipful mindset that's in response to God is in, inherently prayer. So if God is, through the Spirit, is calling you to be a missionary, your response to it by doing it is, in fact, a form of prayer. Being a missionary or just your own personal devotion mm -hmm. to God okay. really is what we're talking about. So look at chapter 2, verse 18 of Ephesians. So I guess we are back in Ephesians. Uh, it says, For through him, that's referring to Christ, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Um, so we see that each person that God had mentioned here and how we access, have access to God, how we respond to God. Um, it's access in one spirit to the Father, that's really that direction upward to God is what prayer is. It's communicating to God in that one spirit. So spirit and prayer definitely need to go together. If you're going to try to tie them apart, then we should use the term Holy Spirit instead of prayer. If you, if you are defining prayer any other way than it being done in the spirit, then we should maybe have a different term there. So look at this quote here. I thought this was helpful by Piper. It says, Prayer is God's appointed means in bringing grace to us uh, and glory to himself. So we see something happening to us here. We receive grace. 
and we see something uh, for God in receiving glory. This is crystal clear in Psalm 50, 15. God says, Call on me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you shall glorify or and you shall glorify me. So it's the power of missions, um, because it's done in the Spirit, uh, where we have access to God. But then what happens when we pray? Um, we actually receive something. It says we receive grace, right? Um, And God gets glorified. We receive grace, God gets glorified. This is really, again, what we were talking about when it comes to missions. Uh, Missions is for us to display the, or the church doing missions is for us to display the wisdom of God, for him to get glory and It displays the wisdom of God because we receive grace. Um, So we see both of those two things happening as we do missions. And so it's um, done in and through prayer as the church prays and has communion with God. Did you have a hand up? No. I have a couple of passages here just about prayer really quick. Um, Does anyone want to read Romans 15? Thank you. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience, by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around the Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. Wonderful. And then uh, 1 Corinthians 3. Who wants to read that one? Now, hopefully tie it together. Tyler. I planted Apollo's water, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. All right. Um, so here, the highlight is, what the, are the words that I italicized on your note sheet? Um, that, for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. So we see Christ doing the action, but he does it through me. How does he act through me? I'm proposing, really, it's us having a relationship with him, communicating with him in prayer. And Corinthians 3, but only God who gives the growth. Ultimately, uh, we act, but yet God is the one actually doing the work. This is why we can say, back at Piper's quote, God ultimately gets the glory because he ultimately is the one who determines it, the outcome of it. Um, he is the one who accomplishes it, and he is the one who gives the growth. It's his work that he chooses to accomplish through his church. So we have an active part, yes, but it's Christ ultimately doing the work um, in and through us. Christ has accomplished through me, but only God who gives the growth as we um, ultimately evangelize, plant churches. Um, So the through us is where we get to participate in the grace of God as we pray to him in this work. Uh, But God still ultimately gets the glory in and through our prayers as we do this work because he is the one accomplishing it. Any questions on that? Hopefully I'm being semi-clear. All right. Um, Last section here then. What is the price of missions? Um, And uh, Piper talks about suffering a lot in this section. Remember, this is all just the first part of the book. Um, talks about suffering ultimately as the price of missions. And this is first and ultimately seen in Christ, right? Where did this mission start? It started, we could look at John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This is the mission of God sending his son here on earth so that we may have salvation, right? For all who believe um, will be saved. 
Uh, so it's Christ is the one starting the mission. Ultimately, it's Christ's mission. Uh, and what is, this, what is the price of this mission for Christ? I mean, it's his suffering on the cross. So we see it first and foremost, ultimately, with Christ on the cross. Um, this is the price of missions. But then here, uh, I think Piper helpfully uh, shows that this is a call, a price that we have also been, that has been handed down to us. This is a mission that has been handed to the apostles and then to the church, which is the mystery of God that was planned for eternity past, um, that we would continue this mission and display the glory of God in it. Um, and the price of this mission is suffering, which doesn't sound very fun <laughs> for us. Um, so let's look at a couple of these passages. And then I think Piper helpfully um, gives six reasons God ap- uh, appoints suffering for his servants. So now it's being applied then for those who are carrying out the mission. Does anyone want to read First Peter two twenty through twenty one? All right, thank you, Nancy. Yeah. It's very explicit when it says, For to this you have been called. Um, our Savior has suffered uh, on the cross for us, right? And it says, Leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Uh, obviously, this isn't saying that we ought to seek out suffering for us in this world. That's not our goal is suffering in itself. Our goal we've already established is to glorify God, uh, is to create more worshipers, um, even at the expense of you suffering for it. So if you suffer for it, that's what's to be expected. You're not seeking out the suffering. We are to pursue this mission even when we suffer in, in, in it um, as a result of it. So that's what really this is coming down to. Uh, and then Hebrews 13. Who wants to read that one? Thank you, Jasmine. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Wonderful. Jesus also suffered outside the gates. This is obviously referring to his crucifixion. Um, Outside the gates, yes, to sanctify his people in his own blood. It's very explicit there. As we already stated, it begins with, with Christ's suffering as he is an example for us. And that as we follow in his footsteps, we are to carry our own cross, Scripture talks about. Um, so obviously, therefore, we are to follow him. Um, go outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Ultimately, the kingdom of God. Um, and so we can suffer in this world. Uh, as we pursue this mission that Christ has given us because this world is not our home, um, but we seek for a city that is to come, right? When Christ returns for us, the eternal state with with God in heaven, um, where he will be our king and we will be his people um, when we are made holy and when we are prepared ultimately for that by being made holy, Um, So again, we're not seeking out suffering in and of itself because that's not the end. That's not the goal. The end, the goal is uh, the the glory of God, uh, for God to be worshipped. That's the purpose of missions. That's um, ultimately accomplished by establishing churches, more churches for the kingdom of God to be physically seen here on earth as more worshippers are worshipping him. Um, That's done through the church where we see the wisdom of God on display for that. Um, And as we, we do this, We may suffer, and we do it in spite of our suffering um, for for the sake of Christ, because the one we're following suffered as he brought 
salvation to us. All right, so these are six different things that Piper brings out that I think are very helpful. Uh, six reasons God appoints suffering for his servant. So Piper goes as far to say as he actually appoints it um, when believers suffer for Christ as they're carrying out the Great Commission. And it's for our benefits many times. Um, so first one, suffering deepens faith and holiness. Uh, I think we could all understand that. I think that's probably the easiest one of the six to understand how um, it's through our suffering we're made humble, right? Uh, we're, we're being sanctified. We're, making, we're being made more into the image of Christ because we are prideful people, because we are boastful people, because we need to be made humble, humbled. We need to be lowered, and that happens through suffering. Um, you can look up on your own time, sec, own, t- own time, 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 9. I just put these references on here for your own uh, further study. Uh, second, suffering makes the reward of God's glory increase. Um, so at the end, right, we're running this race to, for the reward. Which, what is the reward? Ultimately, it's Christ himself. And uh, basking in the glory of God in eternity and suffering makes the reward of God's glory even more sweet. Uh, you can look here again in Second Corinthians. Third, suffering is the price of making others bold. We see here in Philippians 1.14 where uh, others are emboldened to share the gospel uh, because of uh, suffering and other believers. Four, suffering fills up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Um, this sounds confusing, so if you want, you could turn to Colossians um, 1.24 here. Colossians 1.24, so this is the fourth one. Um, so this is Paul speaking. In 124 it says, Now I rejoice in my suffering for y- your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. So he's doing this something for the church. What does it mean? What is he getting at here uh, when he says, I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of the church? What does that mean? Well, Christ's afflictions are not lacking in their um, atoning um, purposes, right? Christ's afflictions on the cross accomplished fully what they were intended to accomplish. So his atoning sacrifice on the cross is sufficient. So it's not referring to that. Um, They are lacking, so Christ's afflictions here, at least in this passage, um, they are lacking in that they are not known and felt by people who were not at the cross. So we, it, it's not known um, the weight of what was actually paid um, at the cross when Christ died, but we get a glimpse of that, at least the, the Christians here were getting a glimpse of that by seeing um, Paul's sufferings. So I interpret that one a little differently. Okay. Um, maybe I'm wrong. But sure. What were you thinking? Like, I think it, it's like, you know, suffering, when, like, fills up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. That's in you, you know, because I haven't suffered as much as Christ. And so the suffering that I do encounter helps me to be more like Christ. And so mm-hmm. I think it's, it's, that's what it's referring to. Does that make sense? So sure. it's not talking about the suffering that, that's lacking in Christ. It's the, it's the suffering that Paul was lacking to be a, like Christ. Sure, sure. Yeah, that could be a possible interpretation. I was just going along with what Piper was saying here. So he's, he's smart, you're smart. Maybe both are right, I don't know. <laughs> um, but suffering fills up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. And you could spend some time in Colossians 124 trying to unpack that a little bit. Um, five, suffering enforces the missionary command to go. 
Um, and here, at least, how Piper brings this out is looking at Stephen um, and his, his death in Acts. Suffering is used by God uh, to reposition the missionary in places they might not have otherwise gone. Um, we see Stephen being killed. Um, and then as a result, Christians were scattered and the gospel went to other places where it would not have otherwise gone. Six, the supremacy of Christ is manifest in suffering. And we see that, again, a Second Corinthians passage here. There's a lot of Second Corinthians is here. Um, so the purpose of missions is worship, right? It's the power of missions is prayer, and the price of missions ultimately is suffering. Are there any questions or comments about anything here that we talked about today? Um, I felt like this lesson, we kind of like talked about the same topic, but all around it in different ways. And so hopefully it brought together a little bit more of what we have been uh, talking about the past several weeks of the mission of the church um, is ultimately uh, the means and the, or the mission, missions, the church is the means and the end of missions. And that's not saying something differently when we say that ultimately it's, for God to be glorified, um, the ultimate um, end of missions is for the worship of God. Um, so that's the main idea. Hopefully we um, talked all around that and that became a little bit more clear tonight. So, Any final comments or questions about any of this? Do you always have to pay the price for missions? Does that mm-hmm. Um, some to some price. extent. Yeah. Okay. Leaving uh, your family, leaving your friends, leaving the world you know. I'm just talking about like global missions, but there's always going to be a cause. And we could look back at just the cost of being a Christian. Um, Galatians 2.20, for I've been crucified with Christ, so it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. Uh, there's an aspect of dying, right? Dying to our old self so that Christ could live within us. Giving up the ability to, I, you know, you can no longer live a were living in, like a depraved life, doing the things that you wanted to do, you no longer be able to do that, so it's costing you the freedom to be able to choose some of those things without having the kind of, well, yeah. immediate consequences. And we know the benefit, ultimately, the, um, is far greater in the end, which is the blessing of being with God in eternity. I'll close this out in prayer since we're a couple minutes past, and then we can talk more. Lord, we love you, and again, we praise you, God, for who you are. We thank you for the gift of your Son and the salvation we have in Christ alone, Lord, through faith alone. Lord, I pray that you will embolden us to preach the gospel um, with our friends and with our neighbors around us here in Springfield. Uh, Because we know it's the purpose that you have given us, Lord, as your church, as First Baptist Church of Springfield. Lord, I pray that we will intentionally do that together as a church body um, so that we can do what you have created us to do, Lord, uh, so that more believers will come to know you and uh, the church can grow, Lord. And we thank you that this has been your purpose in eternity past, that we can be a part of your body, Lord, and receive the riches of your grace. We pray these things in your name. Amen.